All right, Marina, can I get a thumbs up if you see the recording? Excellent. Okay, so let's do some introductions tonight. Um, I would like to start with folks from the district. So Megan, would you like to introduce your team? Yeah, good evening, everybody. I'm Megan Lee with the District of Seashelt, uh, Manager of Demo Development Engineering and Sustainability, uh, and I'm the Project Manager on the district side. Uh, next, we have Marina Stepovic, she's Community Planner, um, and Lindsay Vickers, who is the Manager of Communications. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. And I think I mentioned that I'm from Stantec already, but I will pass the mic over to Ian and Joe to introduce themselves. You're muted, Ian. <laughs> oh, well, that was the best introduction ever. So the second best introduction is that I'm Ian Wilson. Um, I'm uh, kind of running the show mostly with uh, the Transportation Master Plan with some senior senior level um, support and uh, Joe's uh, on the team as well as sort of a um, technical lead and, and a bit of an expertise in active transportation and, and some of the other aspects of the transportation master plan. Thank is that you. a pass? Is that a pass to me, Ian? You got me covered. I think. <laughs> yeah, unless you have okay. something really special to say. Yeah, thanks, because I tend to talk too much. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Now to open our meeting off, I'd like to pass the microphone back to Megan to provide some opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, so welcome and thank you all for attending our meeting tonight. Uh, the District of Seashells is creating a new transportation master plan to guide how we will plan and prioritize our communities growing and changing transportation needs looking through the next 20 years. <clears throat> Stantec Consulting has been hired to lead the design of the Transportation Master Plan, but you play a key role in providing information and feedback. Ian Wilson, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, Ian Wilson from Stantec will be presenting what a Transportation Master Plan is and what it is not, uh, and what Stantec is looking for from you. Uh, Zoe will then explain the various ways to provide that information and feedback. So again, thank you for your time tonight, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thanks for that, Megan. Okay, so as we have it set up tonight, oh, Ian, are you ready? Ready to yeah. go? Yeah. Hi, sorry, I, I, when I when I shared my screen, my Zoom controls disappeared, so I found them again. <laughs> ah, excellent. I know we all have to, and as we switch from office to home for evening stuff, everything changes on the laptop screen, right? Great, so Ian, uh, the mic is all yours. Ian's gonna give us a presentation, folks, and we're gonna follow that up with a facilitated question and answer session. All right, so Ian, we'll pass that over to you. All right, that sounds good. Thank you, Zoe and, and Megan and everyone else. Um, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I'll warn you now, there's a lot of text on these slides. Um, they're good text, I put them there myself. Um, but I'm not just going to sit here and read them. I think sort of the the benefit of doing a meeting like this is that we can sort of talk more freely and kind of convey the key points and, and make it more of a conversational thing than just reading through some text because anyone can read text online. Um, so if I don't touch on anything, it's not because it's not important. It's just because I'm trying to you know keep, keep it brief and, and interesting and, and let us get to some questions. Um, I guess just a, a bit of a housekeeping. Um, my camera is right there. The screen I'm sharing is right there, and everyone's cameras are over there. So if I'm looking around, it's not that I'm ignoring you. I'm just managing <laughs> where everything is in relation to myself. So um, that's that. And, and uh, as we said, the uh, questions will we'll kind of get to them at the end. We, should, we have lots of time for questions. This, this won't be a long presentation. So um, feel free to ask them in advance, um, but we'll, we'll kind of come to them at the end. Um, and I guess kind of building off what Megan said, looking at the project goals, um, really the, the overarching goal is just to bring, bring sort of all of the various things together. Um, there's a lot of uh, sort of sustainability plans and, and community plans that have been done, as well as sort of 
all the different aspects of transportation, whether that's, you know, daily crosswalk or traffic signal or stop sign things or, you know, developments and whatever else, trying to, to build essentially a 20 year plan that brings all of that together and, and helps the community meet their, uh, their existing goals and policies. Um, and then also the underlying aspect is it needs to be sort of realistic and usable. Like it's, we can't, we can't make a 20 year plan where, you know, every person is going to have their own private tube to every destination they want to go to because it's just not feasible. So it, it, it's sort of the, we want to sort of dream big to, to push ourselves, but at the same time, we need to be sort of realistic. So it's, it's about striking that balance and, and making it something that fits, fits for Seashell. And then kind of coming, coming into the, the challenges, which is also a, a key consideration is that um, like we can't undo the past, right? Well, the, the transportation network that's in, in Seashell right now is, is there. We can't go and redraw where the roads are and that one intersection that's slightly askew, we can't necessarily fix that easily. That's the way it is right now. So we are building from what we have now and, and that comes with challenges and opportunities and, and we do our best to sort of use that as a base and build on it toward that vision. And then as far as jurisdictional limitations, um, you know, the main spine of Seashelt is not under Seashelt's control as, as the highway under the Ministry of Transportation's control, um, as well as sort of recognizing the neighboring communities and, and municipalities that really shape sort of the, the whole community outside of, you know, the district proper. Um, so kind of balancing that and, and fitting in with the geographical constraints and then making all of that fit with, you know, without exorbitant property taxes is, is also sort of part of the balance. And then just acknowledging that, you know, we, we don't have a huge group of people here, but I'm sure that if you guys all sat down the room, you would have different opinions on at least one item of to do with transportation. So it is a balance of, of finding kind of what is the general consensus of the public and, and how do we build a, a network that works for the public and, and sort of has the objectives they're looking for, but also recognizing that we need to sort of focus on the policies and, and all of that documentation in place that has been developing over the years in Seashell. Um, but I guess the, the, the flip side is the public are the people who have the best information. So the reason we're talking to you is because you guys, you guys have the information. I, I know the technical side, um, you know, Megan and her team, they know sort of the, the municipality side of how does all of this work with policy and stuff, but, but the real information is coming from the public. So we want to, we want to engage, we want to give you as much opportunity to sort of have your input and, and identify where the problems are, what's working, what's not working, as well as sort of, you know, check our recommendations and make sure that they fit within the community and within your needs. Um, so now that, now that you know what we're doing and the challenges, um, you know, sort of what, what is the transportation master plan? Um, and I've, I've kind of alluded to it, uh, you know, we're doing a 20 year plan. It's about establishing a vision and then sort of filling in the gaps of how do we get from where we are today to that vision. So that it's going to be um, first sort of understanding where we're at and then building that long term vision and, you know, highlighting what are the key priorities in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years and kind of going, going from that point um, and recognizing that transportation is not just roads and vehicles. There's sidewalks, there's parking, there's bike trails, there's transit, there's taxis. There's, there's lots of ways to get around and, and the more choice we can give people, sort of the more healthy the, the network can be. And the purpose of a transportation master plan, um, again, there's a lot of great text on, on screen, you're welcome to read or, or come back later and read. But I think sort of the, the, real, the real benefit of it is how do we, how do we align everything and, and sort of have a vision so that when a development permit comes in, the, the, the city knows how to handle it. They know sort of what the priorities are. They know what the standards are. Um, when council's looking at which, which program should we fund this year, we can look and say, okay, well, what's, what's the goal? What are we trying to get to? And instead of evaluating every project in isolation, we can have this overarching plan, this vision of 
this is where we want to end up. And then all of the decisions and all of the actions can come back to that. Um, and part of, part of doing that is making sure it aligns with the past work that's been done. Um, there's the integrated community sustainability plan that was completed. And then sort of underneath that is the official community plan, which talks about where, uh, where development will happen, what the land uses are, population growth, that kind of thing. And then underneath that is a lot of supporting documents. And one of those is the transportation master plan because transportation and communities and land, land use and are all very tied together. And it's not that one supports the other, it's that they're like symbiotic. They, they need each other to thrive. You can't have a great transportation network if you don't have great land use and you can't have great land use if you don't have a great transportation network. So um, working with all of the other documents as well as sort of fitting under the umbrella of these higher documents um, will be sort of key in, in getting to the final goal. Um, and then also just bringing in sort of the technical expertise, bringing in the information from the community, from the district, um, and any sort of available data we have and, and projections moving forward. Um, one of the early tasks was sort of to create a bit of a project vision. So we, we've, we've done this exercise and we've come up with one, but we're not 100% sure on it, if that makes sense. We still, we kind of wanted to have something to bounce off the public and make sure that this fit. It, it seemed to fit, but we wanted to sort of get some feedback on it. So don't take this as this is 100%, but presumably it's 90, 95%, I would think. But um, sort of what we came up with is thoughtfully connecting our community in an inclusive, inviting, and sustainable way. Um, so sort of highlighting some of the key things about the thoughtfulness, sort of having that overarching vision and plan. Um, inclusive, meaning we're, we're letting, whether you're, you're five or 95, you can get around and have options. Inviting means making it fun, making it something people look forward to instead of the worst part of their day. And, and sustainable is sort of recognizing that, um, you know, preserving, preserving the natural beauty of the, of the locale as well as just, you know, larger global issues and, and, and uh, health and, and all sorts of factors. So that's, uh, that's where we've ended up and we look forward to sort of getting feedback on that from, from you guys and, and everyone else in the community. And on, on that note for the, uh, the engagement, that sort of, it, that wraps up, I guess, the, uh, um, you know, the what is the TMP. I realize it's brief. Uh, if you have more questions, we're, we're happy to answer them. Um, looking forward, uh, we're kind of in this uh, <laughs> stage two. We sort of kicked off, we're, we've, we've done some visioning. Now we're starting to look at the existing conditions. And, and part of that is getting as much information as we can from the public, because that's where a lot of that information is held. So that's sort of the, the task now. And then as we sort of go through that assessment, um, we'll start summarizing things. Then we'll start looking to the future, saying, okay, we know where we're at. We kind of know where we're going. What does that future vision look like? And then once we sort of have some, some recommendation, some idea of where we're potentially going to go and how we're going to get there, then we'll come back and do some more engagement and say, here's a specific plan we have. How do we, um, you know, how do, does this fit? Does, does this meet your objection? Or does this meet your, um, your vision of, of what it would be? And sort of look for some feedback and, and ask about what, what priorities should come first and what priorities should maybe be postponed a bit and, and kind of go from there. Um, and then we'll, and then sort of from that, we'll finalize the TMP, kind of get it through council, at which point it'll be sort of a, a, a the document the city can, can start using and, and help to shape the, the future transportation network. Um, so recently, I think this week or last week, the, uh, the <laughs> I'm going to say this slow because it is a mouthful, your say Seashelt uh, page has gone live. Um, so there's a QR code if you just want to hold your phone up to that. I know we talked about mobile phones being distracting, but this is one good use of them. If you just pop your phone up to that, it'll take you to that page, or you can type in or search on Google. Um, and here's sort of some of the, we have a number of things on there. So I'm just going to uh, jump over there now. 
Uh, so if you go there, you'll, you'll get to this landing page. There's some, some wonderful text. Uh, there's some, some key dates and sort of a bit of a timeline, some contact information. I believe that this presentation will be going up there, potentially the presentation, probably the recording as well to be confirmed, but there's some good information. There's the vision statement. Uh, and then down here is sort of where, where your opportunity to engage is. There's, there's an ideas board. Um, you can start putting in like, you know, it would be great if we had a, you know, an a, a hangout area at the beach that we could use as a staging area for bicycle site tours or something, or, or, uh, you know, this, this road connection isn't working. Could we have an extra turn bay or a signal or something? So any sort of ideas you have, big or small, share them here. If you want to start some discussion, again, follow the engagement rules. Keep it, keep it civil. This is sort of about getting feedback. So there's so ideas. Ian, yeah. the ideas board, would that be the right location if people wanted to provide you some feedback on the project vision? Like you mentioned, you were looking for feedback about thoughtful connections for inclusivity, um, being inviting and being sustainable. Is this the right place for them to put those ideas? I think so. It's, it, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of sort of overlap um, where you can, you can sort of answer things in a different way. You can just send emails as well. There's a well, I think I think Lindsay can confirm that, but there is a communications at, at seashell.ca email. Um, but I, I think the ideas board is sort of a good place. Um, if it's a specific geographic idea, there is an, a map for that, but I think that would be a good place. There is, I believe, a question in the survey as well, um, discussing that to some extent. So um, and, and if you have any specific questions in this meeting, you can you can bring it up here. So I, I think sort of whatever whatever is the best route for you to engage. If if the idea of an ideas board doesn't doesn't fit and you want to write a letter, write a letter. <laughs> it, it it obviously makes things a little trickier to sort of compile information, but at the end of the day we want people to be comfortable giving their information. So Okay, thanks Ian. So it looks like there's a few different ways that people can participate in engagement in this phase. So there's the Your Say Seashell page. There's meetings like this. There is an online survey, a quick poll, an interactive map. And then as you mentioned, there's the, the emails for the, the staff. That's right, Marina, Megan, Lindsay, all those emails go to you, right? Yes. Excellent. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just jump into the map for a second, just to sort of give you an idea of um, what it looks like. So this this is great. It's sort of people can go in and and create pins and say, oh, you know, like this one here, uh, cycling walk infrastructure between downtown Seashell and the high school should be made clear and safe. So like that's sort of a good you know information of okay the there may be an opportunity to sort of improve that. Um, or if it's a car-based one, some traffic calming near the school. Um, so like these, these, are, these are great comments. And, and what's great about it is they're geographically tagged. So we can come in and say, oh, this is where there's a lot of issues. Or if you, you know, say, it'll make, like, we'll do a test one. Um, so you can go to this add pin here. Uh, let's say it's a cycling one. You just, this is, the, this is the slightly tricky part. You just drag it over. It's not a click and, whatever. So, you know, you could put it there and you could say, uh, you know, a bike connection here would be great. Ian, Apple. are these all your pins so far on this map? No, they're not. I, the only one of mine is, is a test pin. <laughs> <laughs> so I will, you know, and then you enter your email um, and then you put your you know, screen name, which I just put test, and then you agree and you just submit. And I believe you can add an image as well. I haven't tested that out, but you, you do this and then um, it says, thank you for contributing. And then about 30 seconds later, you'll get an email saying, we got your note, thank you for doing that. Um, and I believe you can also register for the, the Your Say Seashelt um, site and all of this will be a little easier, but um, that's sort of what we're looking for and, you know, it's great to see that there's already things coming in there and, and 
if you're able to provide information here, this is a great source to go in and just get a feel for, for sort of what's, miss, what's missing and, and where are there some potentials. Thank you for that demonstration, Ian. Oh, and I, I have a picture of it too, if that has. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think, yeah, uh, Zoe, you kind of touched on this. If you want to yeah, go over it again, that, that's basically the end of my, my presentation. <laughs> I think the only one that we missed was the advisory group that the, yeah. the project team is actively recruiting. So you can join the community advisory group. You can do that by contacting um, the district staff that are on the call, or of course, by using the district emails. We're going to be doing another open house like this again on June 2nd. So please encourage others to participate and uh, get involved in the plan. Yeah, and, and just, and that, presentation will be sort of this one again it's not mm -hmm. it's not sort of new and different but it's another opportunity you know, it'll be in person with the uh, with the seashell staff um, I won't be there this time but I, I'll, I plan on being there for the for the next round of one so um, I won't be there in person but you can come in and talk to the city staff and and have conversations and ask about that community advisory group or any other questions you have too And that session, if I can just add, will be on June 2nd from 1 till 6, I believe is what it says on the website. And it's at, Seashell, at the Seaside Centre in Seashell. Thank you, Marina. Ian, what do you have left in your presentation? Um, I just have a slide that says questions. Questions. All right. Well, you know, the, the chat box has been um, very, very quiet, if I do say so. <laughs> so um, now's the time, folks, all of those questions that you've been writing down uh, and keeping in your brain for Ian and Joe, uh, now's the time to ask them. So I see Susanna has her hand up. So I'll go to you first, Susanna. I, was, I might have missed this during the presentation, but can you just clarify what Stantec's role is in this process versus what the district or, or what the, the town does? Yeah, do, uh, do, I can take that unless you want to, Megan. <laughs> no, you go ahead, Ian. Okay, yeah, so so the, the district has, has brought us in to essentially do the plan, um, sort of using, uh, we've, we've done a number of these and um, you sort of using that technical expertise to come in and, and do the technical work um, and sort of help do those recommendations. But we're also working closely with the district because they have a better, better understanding of the local context and, and sort of some of that local policy. So it, it can be a little challenging to, to get that nuance of, of what is the community and making sure that this is a good fit for the community. So it's, it's very much a collaborative thing, but, but Santec sort of providing that technical expertise and, and doing sort of much of the work with, with guidance from, from the district and input from the community. Anything to add, Megan? No, I, I would just agree with that. It's, it's a collaborative effort, but the technical work uh, and the work bulk, the workload would be um, for Stantec with uh, significant uh, input and direction from, from district staff, and then of course, feedback from the community uh, in shaping this and making it our own. Thank you both. Let's but, go actually, to can Bill. I, sorry, oh. can I add just one more thing quick? And, and also the, the district's doing a really good job of sort of, you know, helping the engagement as well like we're, we're doing engagement tools and they're also sort of working on that as well so you might you might see marina standing at a bus stop handing out pamphlets at some point or something but <laughs> it's it's been uh, yeah it's, it's working really well and hopefully we can we can get out and reach as many of you as we can okay i'd like to go to bill now thank you very much zoe and to the district staff for putting this on um I am a totally blind person, so what was ever on the screen, Ian, I could not see, <laughs> That's nor fair. did my computer read it to me. So I have little objections when it comes to say over there, over here, and over there. But besides that there, it was pretty good. Just want to make bring it to your attention, sir. That is all that not everybody on this call can see. Thank That's you all. very much for that, Bill. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my question is, I have not crossed one street in over th almost three years because the safety of it. 
I've also questioned sighted people who have fully full eyes and they do drive, so I assume they can see. Uh, they also have trouble crossing the same street and that's Wharf and Highway 101, especially going um, west to east on the north side of the street of um, Wharf Street and Dolphin. So I mean, going from the insurance company to the Daily Roast for those who don't, do not know the area. That is one of the most dangerous crossings in this community. And ladies and gentlemen, I do not drive. I do not ride a bicycle. I do not play around on a skateboard or anything else. I use two feet for my motorization. It is one of the most dangerous corners in this community. It took me a long time to get the audible light onto that corner. That has done some safety aspects, aspects of it, but I will not cross that street until I get a new guide dog. A lot of other blind people in this community and there are 75 visually impaired um, citizens in this community with six of them in this immediate corner. And I live almost on, not on the corner, but I live pretty close to the corner, just one block off. So I know the hazards, the dangers and how busy it is. Is there any uh, plans in the near future, I mean near future, to adjust and fix this corner for pedestrians and vehicular traffic. Thank you very much. So Bill, if I could just dive into uh, your comment a little bit more there. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned it's the, the most hazardous crossing. Um, and for, for folks like Ian and I who don't live in Seashelt, okay. um, can, you, can you explain um, the, the different things that are contributing to the hazards that you experience at that crossing? Okay, if you go, and please use your directions because I'm, I'll use east, west, north, and south, okay? Okay. On the, um, on my, I, I live on the north side of Dolphin Street, okay? So if I walk down the north side of Dolphin towards Wharf Avenue, which is going east, on that corner is the insurance company. And if I cross there, I'm crossing one, two, three, four heavy trafficked lanes going east. On that, on the east, northeast corner of that area is a nice huge concrete block with a big, huge bush of trees on it. Also, there's a lot of posts on there. It is a corner that cannot be readjusted for um, paving or digging up. As you said earlier, the roads are the roads and they are what they are and is what it is. There is a traffic signal on there, an APS, an um, audible pedestrian signal on it, which lasts 14 seconds long in duration as the signal beeps and an additional 14 seconds with the white man standing there until it turns red. So you have a total of 28 seconds to cross the street. As a blind person, as I, I will not cross that street on my own, but when I had my puppy, I only crossed when the light started to beep because I know, and I'm a pretty good walker. I can walk three miles an hour without blinking an eye. And I know as soon as I got halfway across that street to your, um, I guess, what are the yellow lines going down the center or white lines? I don't know what color they are, but I know as soon as I got to the center, the audible light stopped. The audible signal stopped, but the, of course the light was still going. And you also have left pardon me, right-hand turns coming off the highway onto Wharf, going north on Wharf, coming, going west on the, on the highway there, mm -hmm. turning right. And you'd be surprised how many ve vehicles come up onto that sidewalk to make the right-hand turn. Okay. That is another reason why I don't cross there without a guide dog. Oh, yes, there is ramps on or cutouts on each each side of that on each side of those corners there's no problem there one ramp goes into a sewer but i've got used to that there and you can't adjust that um but that is like i say is the most dangerous corner and i and i've dared many people to cross it blindfolded and they won't do it so mm -hmm. i know how dangerous it is and mm -hmm. unfortunately yes we have lost some people have said goodbye on that corner unfortunately but that's the hazards of that corner Mm -hmm. And I have crossed every single street in this district. I can guarantee you that. Bill, thank you so much for um, providing that additional insight there. Um, the, in the chat box, I'm seeing 
uh, other folks saying that they also really struggle with that intersection. Um, so I, I think your comments are resonating with a lot of folks on the call here. So, uh, sorry, sorry if I can just chime in. Um, this, I was trying to be a fly on the wall for this um, engagement session, but I can't resist. Um, I actually have a bit of good news for Bill. Um, the district really? is yes, we. I do have good news. Um, it's not going to be a total fix of all the issues you've identified. Obviously, we have to work with the ministry on that, and uh, you know we're getting uh, upwards of six months on uh, getting a permit from the ministry to do any work. But uh, on the side of Wharf, um, I guess from going from Acacia Park all the way up to that intersection and the particular concrete area um, you're talking about, we are creating a new pedestrian pathway there where there was none before. Are you and talking should, on the east side, sure, or the west side? Yeah, yeah uh, east, the uh, west, west. It would be on, on the east side where... Uh, the insurance company uh, is. Okay, uh, Acacia Park. Yeah. Okay, I know where Acacia Park is. Yeah. Okay, that, okay, that side's okay. It's the other side, sir. It's the okay. other corner yeah. I'm really focusing on. The, the focus is on the west side of the, on the west, northwest corner to the northeast corner. The south side, I can get around on. I can walk there blindfolded. No problem. So de definitely on our radar. Uh, okay. we're, 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 we're chipping away at it. And that first stage would be um, dealing with the west side that has no sidewalk. So that should help a little bit um, with the intersection there. And, um, and then we're also um, upgrading other streets in the downtown. And when we do those, we add the um, cactile strips um, at each intersection, which uh, I, ho I hope is helpful. Um, for for you and so um but just to realize that uh, we do have a partner with the ministry of transportation infrastructure and uh uh you know trying to get them to um align with the kind of works that we need is um not always an easy task but we're always trying to do that here at the district so just wanted to share that with you thank you Thank you, sir. And if I may comment, one more comment, please, Zoe. Of course, Bill, go ahead. And then we'll get to Nicholas, yeah, who's been waiting you. patiently. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, sir, um, just to let you know, the White Cane Club of the District of Seashell, which is a member of the Canadian Council of Blind, where I sit as its first vice president of its province, of this province, was the people responsible for those tactile uh, cutouts. The Our White Cane Club, 10 people of 10 members of our white cane club decided upon the color and the design of those tech of those cutouts and they are all yellow cutouts i know they are i got told they were but i was promised they were and the blind people of this community were the decision makers on those cutouts thank you very much and i'll shut up <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very do. much for, thank mm -hmm. you very much bill for that uh, perspective because i'm relatively new here but i'm uh, I'm very pleased to uh, find out that uh, you are a part of the decision-making process on that. So thank you very much for that uh, feedback. Mm -hmm. I'll echo Kern's comments. Thank you, Bill, for that. Okay, Nicholas, thank you for waiting. No problem. I, I just had a quick question around the, you mentioned something about an advisory committee um, related to this project and, and sort of suggesting um, that we contact District of Seashell staff if we wanted to participate in that. I'm just wondering what the um, terms of reference of that would be and, and what time commitment uh, it would be looking like and what the role of that committee might, might be. Okay, okay, we might have a volunteer here. Megan, do you wanna yeah. take that one? Yeah, I can speak to that. So uh, we're, we're looking to, to form just a, uh, a working group uh, to meet uh, two to three times in between this stage of the uh, plan and the uh, the fall probably the fall of this year um, we're looking for between maybe eight and and, and 16 people um, to just meet more informally and discuss the plan the issues and, and get some more detailed feedback on on the plan as it develops before the next phase of public engagement um, so the time commitment would be uh, two, at, at least two sessions, um, and the sessions would be maybe approximately two hours long. Um, and then there wouldn't be any additional work beyond that. It would be the feedback, um, and then potentially there'd be some emails in between with, with information to review, but uh, it would be fairly reasonably minimal um, to try to garner more participation. So we're just kind of gauging the interest at this stage to see if we have enough people interested um, in forming a working group. 
that cover off your question, Nicholas? Do you have any follow up? Yeah, I, I think so. I'm, I'm not 100% sure, sure sort of like what the role of that uh, working group is. Is it to sort of, um, is it like reviewing the detail of the plan and and sort of ground truthing it or? It would be um, to discuss kind of the concept. So when we come up with some of these, um, the more details of what the plan is looking like, it would be to kind of go in more depth and discuss these ideas with a kind of a, a group with a broader um, cross section of, of, of people and backgrounds to get feedback from different perspectives on, on the approach we are going, depending on what the issue is, whether it's, you know, active transportation or safety or, or, or whatever we may be discussing, it's to go a little bit deeper into those issues with a community perspective before we present them in the plan. Okay, sure. Yeah, sign me up. <laughs> I'll put you down. <laughs> Thanks, Nicholas. Do we, do we have some more questions, Zoe, or should I, should I pose one to see if we you get know? some responses? That might be good, Ian. Um, get people thinking. Sometimes when you put a 20-year plan in front of people, it is hard to know what kind of feedback to share with the project team. So I'm not seeing any questions in the chat box, but you are invited to put questions and comments in there or raise your hand. Um, so Ian, why don't you go ahead and, and pose your question to the group? And we'll be looking to Bill, Candice, Cedric, Lynn, Susanna, and Nicholas to uh, provide some feedback for you. Yeah, I think, um, and like th th this question, if you want to just put it in chat, uh, you could either do it anonymously or or as your name. But I guess sort of like what the, you know, if you're, if you were sitting down having coffee with a friend from another community, right, what would what would be the the one thing you'd say this is this is the best part about moving around seashells and and or what would be the uh you know what would be the thing that just drives you crazy the most like i've <laughs> I, we've, we've heard bills already and i appreciate that so that's uh that's definitely going to shape our um you know our, our 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 opinion sort of going forward so just you know sort of high level if it if it's a specific crossing of every time I go to this intersection, it's terrible, or if it's just generally of like, I just find, you know, the trails too bumpy, like sort of whether it's high level or, or low level, what, what's your, uh, what's your, your best and worst experiences moving around seashells? Okay, so I'm seeing that the bike lane on Trail Avenue is the best. And uh, I'm wondering if um, you'd like to pop your mic on and tell us what makes it the best. Um, I can't drive and I have to either walk or ride my trike to get around. And there's very, there's almost no separated bike infrastructure in, on the Sunshine Coast and the Trail Avenue bike lane is separated. Um, and so it actually feels really safe. And so it's easy for me to use. Um, especially if I'm not feeling well and there's a huge hill on Trail Avenue. And so having a separated lane is especially nice for that. Um, and you know, all the trucks, like so many people here drive these enormous pickup trucks and I'm just like invisible because I have a disability and my balance is poor. So I don't actually ride a bike. I ride a tricycle. Um, and I'm like a little lower to the ground than, than a bike. I'm just completely invisible to a lot of the trucks here, um, a lot of the vehicles. And so having that separated lane is like so essential. Um, and so Trail Avenue takes you straight to Trail Bay Mall, which you can basically do all the errands you need to do on a day-to-day -day basis in that area and like in that really compact downtown. And so I can just get on that bike lane and then that's all I have to do. And I don't have to interact with cars that much. Um, and so it's a safe, easy way for me to actually do what I need to do around town. Okay, so it sounds like that that separation is really the biggest thing for you, Susanna. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and apparently, Ian, there, there's new photos that show the new extensive yeah. bike lane <laughs> there, okay? Yeah. I, I looked like it was maybe a, a newer thing. <laughs> so uh, I'm also hearing that the trail network behind Davis Bay is awesome. Um, 
And the worst is that trails don't connect to Wilson Creek or into Seashelt. So I'm wondering if um, Nicholas, would you like to speak to your comment there? I mean, sure, I, I'm a Davis Bay resident. So um, having explored those trails a little bit, it, it's just, uh, they're not always uh, marked really well. And, and they sort of, uh, it's a huge asset for residents, but it doesn't, doesn't connect through. There's no, there's no easy walking trail to get to Wilson Creek. Um, and, uh, and at the other end, it sort of dead ends at the, um, uh, there's like a BMX or dirt bike track or something out that end. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've just, you know, going that direction, I've gotten stuck. So and there's probably a way to, to cut through in the bush or something, but uh, yeah, it, it would be great to see trail connectivity all throughout Seashell. Okay. Um, I think that would be awesome for active and independent mobility. Mm -hmm. And do you have um, recommendations for the team to consider for um, those connections between Davis Bay and Wilson Creek? Where would be good connection points in your in your mind? Oh, you're gonna, you're going to hear all about it. Don't worry. Yeah, I'll <laughs> I'll give you the whole rundown. I think uh, in in terms of like you know Gun Club Road in behind Canadian Tire, um, at the end of Gun Club would be great to see that connect through somewhere to uh, um, oh, what am I looking for? There's like a a fish hatchery and a few things back in there. They just don't quite line up. Uh, and so you end up cutting through band lands on the south side of the highway and then you're walking along um, while you're, you know, it's not a formal trail network and it's not part of the District of Seashell. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so there's those jurisdictional um, limitations that you're experiencing and there's a real lack of wayfinding. Is that accurate? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And really okay. there's, there's no, there, there just isn't a connection behind like uh, uh, Wilson Creek, Brookman Park and across the other direction, except it pops out sort of up by the hot, but up by the airport, I think it, it kicks out, um, which is quite a ways out of, in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Nick. And you're, you're getting um, high fives in the chat box here. There's lots of people agreeing with you. Um, that there's basically no way to get from Seashell to Davis Bay or Wilson Creek. So that's great. Um, and we have another comment um, about the bike lanes um, and, a, and a promise that more bike lanes are coming. So now I'll go to Susanna and then Marina, I'll let you jump in, okay? So Susanna, you wanna talk about your comment here? Oh, no, I, I was actually gonna ask a question. Oh, um, sure, okay. I hope it doesn't derail things too much. I, I was wondering what the plan is for engaging with the Seashelf Nation uh, on Seashelf's transportation master plan. Um, because part, like that separation between, between Seashell and Davis Bay, like it's partly because of the highway, but also it's, it's through band lands. Um, and a lot of the worst and most dangerous pedestrian and cycling areas are around the band lands, um, partly because, you know, Modi has been hesitant to invest around the band lands. Um, and so I was wondering what, what the plan is for, for engaging with them in this process. Hmm. Great question. Um, that's one that we have heard definitely in our project meetings as well. Um, Megan, would you like to answer that question around engaging with the band? Sure, yeah. So um, at the front end of this plan, uh, it is our, it's our intention to reach out and engage with them uh, specifically and separately um, to bring them on board with, with what we're hoping to do as the plan moves forward and as these kind of issues identify themselves, um, we'll have opportunities then again to try to collaborate or advocate um, for what might need to happen in terms of connectivity, uh, if that uh, means through their jurisdiction. So there'll be further action depending on what comes out of the plan. But certainly there's uh, plans to engage with them specifically and separately um, uh, several times during this um, plan development. Mm -hmm. 
So I'll just uh, read through the comment here, Megan, as well. Um, it goes back to uh, Ian's question about the worst part of getting around Seashelt um, as a cyclist and pedestrian is really the highway. Um, the comment says it's completely unsafe for cyclists and pedestrians, but yet it's the only real connection point between West Seashelt, Seashelt, Davis Bay and Wilson Creek. Yeah, that, <laughs> I, I, I was, I'm sort of, I, from the from the information I've sort of got from the project team that that seems to be something that's likely to come up a lot. Um, and again, jurisdictionally, there's limitations to what we can do there. But but part of part of the benefit of doing a plan like this is we can potentially propose alternate routes or or um, you know other connection points to sort of create a parallel route or an alternate way that that doesn't rely on that. Maybe get some more separated trails, but that's that's uh that's coming up coming up this summer and and this fall we can talk about it more in specifics but definitely something on our radar mm -hmm. so now i haven't heard very much about um folks driving in the community um is anyone on the call uh, a vehicle operator does anyone drive is there anything that you'd like to share with us about uh what's working well with the roads in seashelt and what could be improved No one's willing to self-identify as a, a vehicle operator. <laughs> no, that's okay. I just want to make sure that um, we're able to hear different diverse perspectives tonight. I can I can chime in as a vehicle operator. I and also with my school district hat on. I think one of the one of the um, one of the great things about Sea Shelf is there's very rarely a traffic jam. Uh, you know, driving driving in the lower mainland is is a uh, source of frustration. I think one of the one of the challenges is um, you know pick up and drop off around elementary schools during before and after school, uh, where there's a lot of congestion and lots of concern around safety for pedestrians and and you know that that's the one the one sort of exception to our traffic jam free life here is. Uh, um those those windows and so support for any infrastructure improvements that can enhance active travel and sorry i, I work for the school board so i have to say this but uh, i do believe that uh infrastructure improvements um around schools would be really uh vital and any sort of wayfinding that leads more parents to make the decision to walk with their kids or bike or whatever with their kids can reduce some of that traffic stuff that we see happening in front of schools so mm -hmm. yeah and nicholas is there any um specific uh specifics you can give us about um catchment areas and where you're seeing um a need for more uh infrastructure to get to get families to and from school um i mean i have there's lots of detail. I'm not sure that it necessarily relates to catchment areas so much. We're we're pretty we're pretty rural, um, and you know the there's a number of kids that are bused to school in our context. Obviously, we're um, so I'm not sure what you mean in terms of the catchment areas and how that might relate. But certainly, lots of lots of information for you about um, specific improvements that could be made for sure. Okay, so maybe that's something that the the team can can circle back with you on. Oh yeah, and mm -hmm. and I've got mm -hmm. you know, um, I've been working with Marina on an active travel committee, for example, and uh, it's been great working with her, and and she'll uh, I'm sure liaise with us in terms of um, school district feedback for sure. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so we do have one comment uh, about did, cars. Sorry, can I interrupt? Oh. I did see that Candace had her hand, her physical hand up, but I'm not sure if she still wants oh. to share or not. <laughs> oh, okay. Sure. We'll go to Candace and then to Matt's comment. Okay. Oh, you muted yourself again, Candace. Muting. Okay. There we go. Oh. oh. I think you're can good. Can you hear me now? We can hear yeah. you great. Okay. Uh, with respect to driving a vehicle, uh, my comment, I live in West Seashelt. 
uh, until there was the road through Silverstone, there was no way to get to Seashelt other than walking down the highway or driving. One of the problems with the cut through now uh, from the village to Seashelt is people seem to think it is a drag race. And what needs to be done based on a, because I'm involved with the West Seashell Community Association is more traffic calming because speeding isn't becoming endemic from the village through West Seashelt now. And there have been near misses. So what I'd like to know is what are the plans for traffic calming? And I include everything from stop signs to break up the speed, the acceleration rates. Uh, there are some half roads in West Seashell because the district is waiting for the developer or the landowner is not going to develop that property. So you're having narrow roads, uh, 90 degree turns, people driving on the sidewalk while there are pedestrians, kids walking to school uh, and very few stop signs in, in long distances where you can accelerate up to 80 kilometers per hour, actually. Uh, so is there a plan to coordinate with the RCMP to do something about speeding before someone is injured? Okay, there's lots of questions there. Um, thank you for all of that, Candice. We're gonna try to get through each one, okay? Um, so the, I'm looking at my project team. Who wants to take a stab at that one? Yeah, I can, I can start with it. Um, okay, so perfect. We're, we are certainly aware um, that there is some speed issues um, on that Cowrie, that section of Cowrie connecting to West Seashelt, um, and it, it is on our radar, um, and we are actively looking at it. Traffic calming measures uh, in general would be something that the, that the master plan could speak to in general terms. Um, but specifically talking about coordinating with the RCMP um, specific to this one area would be outside of a master plan, for example. However, the district itself separate from this plan is aware of this issue um, and is looking at it. Okay, yeah. thank now you. Joe, do you wanna maybe quickly touch on Sort of some of the policy kind of stuff we'd put in a tmp for traffic coming sort of thing yeah thanks ian um just finding my mute there um yeah i was gonna say um like if this goes to bill's comment as well with intersection issues uh or where uh you know we understand that there's speeding issues is it you know we can identify some of these areas and provide um you know a bit of a uh a bit of a shopping list if you will of the different measures that we suggest for certain areas. We, I don't think we have the scope to get into uh, the specific solution, but we can certainly offer, um, you know, that uh, say, uh, you know, vertical deflection or, or speed, um, uh, speed humps or uh, curb extensions are better one place versus another corridor. Um, and then for the intersections, you know, like the one that, that Bill gave an example of, you know, what kind of struck me was just sort of the crossing width there and, um, you know, he, he was mentioning some things about sight lines. So I think we can, you know, we have in several other transportation master plans identified some areas that need more uh, study uh, and we can offer some high level suggestions at, at this stage. So, uh, and then, yeah, as far as policy goes, um, I mean, I, I don't know if it's within the scope here, but uh, a lot of TMPs do get into suggesting a traffic calming policy if one's not in place. It's generally reserved for um, kind of a, uh, you know, an equitable treatment if a lot of requests are coming into a client or to a municipality um, on kind of how to prioritize those, but also, you know, to kind of pull the residency on a street uh, to see if, um, you know, there's, there's a consensus or, or more than half um, that, that see it as an issue and, and should capital dollars be put towards that. So um, traffic calming policy is just something to be done to sort of deal with with that down the road, um, we would probably only recommend some measures and you know the idea to do a policy uh, out of this plan. Thank you. So, yeah, Joe, does that um, would those policy include like narrowing the roads and adding stop signs? Like, are those the kind of policy pieces? 
Yeah, so there's a few things we can do within the TMP. I, I'm, I'm sure that we're doing for, for Seashell here is, um, you know, we look at the kind of existing road classifications, their cross sections and width. Uh, we can suggest some reduction per, perhaps to pavement width or travel lane width um, and some measures to, you know, reduce like pedestrian crossing width. So it's not a kind of complete streets uh, principles that can be applied. Um, so that's something we can kind of suggest on the design end. Um, on, the, on the policy end, like at the end of the day, the, the uh, outcome of this um, is highlighting uh, sort of generically improvements um, for, the, for the street cross sections, but also trying to target some specific locations where we see issues. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I, I think it does. Thanks, Joe. Um, but Candice, your comments are getting a lot of support in the chat box um, from people that are agreeing. They say they're interested in seeing the speed limit dropped and the streets designed to slow down cars as well. Um, and I just want to, uh, I think Kern, would you like to come on and um, share uh, share your plan with Candice. I think you tried to direct message her, but it went to me instead. <laughs> Is Kern still with us? Perhaps he's stepped away for a moment, but we'll make sure that uh, he connects with you, Candice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like to go to Councillor McLean. You had a comment for us um, about cars. Yeah, just a frequent one that I hear that um, about a second crossing and alternative routes if the highway is closed. Um, so just recognizing the community concern there and bringing that forward. Okay, and that is um, the need for a second crossing over Chapman Creek. Yeah, over Chapman Creek and any other areas where uh, there's only one alternative route around the highways, such as Havies for the present. Okay. Ian, do you have any follow up questions for Councillor McLean on that? <laughs> um, I, I, I would direct you to the interactive map, I think. No, uh, <laughs> I think that's 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 good, good feedback and, and definitely something sort of on our radar, just even from early discussions that you know, there is, there's a very good spine. Well, there is a spine, whether it's good, we won't give it labels yet, but there is a spine through the, through the district that provides the connection, but in some places it's the only way. Um, and in other places there's a parallel, parallel route and there's speeding issues. So it's a, it's a balance of sort of trying to find that. And again, working within the geometry or sorry, geometry and the geography uh, to sort of make that something that's feasible and, and useful. So if you have uh, specific locations, um, this is for general comment, all of you, I would highly recommend going to that map um, or if you would rather type it up in an email or, or fill it in on an ideas board, um, those are all sort of great ways to get that information um, specifically to us. Great, thanks Ian. Um, now, question for the project team here, how will the TMP interact with the zoning land use plan and changes in Seashelf? The kind of going back to the, the, um, I guess I can actually do that. The sort of the TMP is sort of underneath the OCP, um, which is largely kind of a lot of that zoning information I guess may not the zoning bylaws in there, but but general sort of growth and, and community development. And I think one of the one of the big challenges is sort of um, trying to take the per, the predicted growth from these other deliverables and policies and, and plans and building a transportation network that is adequate for that growth, but also there at the right time. Um, you know, I, I lived in, you know, suburbs of, or, you know, fringes of large cities, and you, you have a community with all these roads, and they had all these signs up saying future bus stop here. But that doesn't help because the people who have bought this house and been living there for three years, they don't have a bus stop right now. So they have a car and they're driving into town every day. So if, if we can get transit service there, 
as people are moving in, then it gives people an option to take that from day one. And we don't have to worry about, you know, we don't have to sort of manage the, how do we get people out of cars? We can just get them into transit day one. And, and same for, for bicycle routes. Of course, the flip side is, it also feels funny running a bus through a cul-de-sac that has one house on it. So it, it's sort of trying to trying to make a plan that, that supports growth and, but is also tied to it. Because at the end of the day, the transportation network and the zoning network need to be in agreement and they need to work together and, and they need to be growing and developing kind of at the same rate and recognizing areas where maybe it's densifying or changing from one area to another, recognize that ahead of time and, and have a plan in place to start adapting the network to accommodate. Thanks, Ian. I saw Joe unmuted himself. Joe, did you have something to add there? No, I, I think Ian answered it perfectly. I was just oh. going to add that, you know, um, thinking about a sustainable plan, one of the important things is, you know, considering, uh, you know, investing in active transportation routes. So how can we accommodate cyclists, uh, pedestrians, transit users more as a way to offset that growth somewhat? So we know from the land use plans, things are going to grow at two or three percent a year. Um, we'll come up with with whatever that growth rate is. Uh, but we can we can um, ease that growth uh, somewhat by encouraging infrastructure that might have people you know get out of the cars to do a trip. But you have to have a safe infrastructure to do that. So I just wanted to highlight that we can uh, part of the purpose of the plan is to try to you know not just have vehicle growth, but try to grab some of those vehicle trips back into other modes. Thanks, Joe. And, and actually, mm -hmm. jumping back to the previous question about parallel routes, I think I've mentioned this before as well. But maybe some of the like obviously redundancy in the network is good and maybe we do need another street connection. But if we can sort of provide those additional connections as bike routes or something, that's something a bit more feasible given geographic uh, limitations rather than putting a roadway through. So there might be opportunity to put some, some sort of redundancy in the network for sort of different modes as opposed to strictly vehicles, but I, it's not as good. Thank you. So I'm going to go to Bill because he has his hand up and then I'll invite Kern to uh, speak to uh, the points Candace raised and then I'll address the rest of the questions in the chat. Okay, so Bill, over to you. Thank you very much, Zoe. Um, I, I didn't bring it up earlier, but it was just brought up regarding transit. I'm understand in the past when I was on a trans transit committee or had a five-year transit plan, there was buses supposed to go up and through Sandy Hook and that area. That has not um, been uh, fulfilled. Um, I know that when I lived out in Half Moon Bay, four o'clock in, um, in the afternoons, in the wintertime, buses were just, did not run. So people were getting off in the dark. Um, so, and the lighting out in Half Moon Bay was terrible. Even for a blind man, I couldn't even see around. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> Uh, there, because there's no lights out there, and so I think there should be long, bus. The Half Moon Bay bus should run longer than 6:30 at night. Uh, keep on the summer schedule all year round, except going out to areas that may not pick up anybody. But there is pedestrians or passengers that would go in and out on that Half Moon Bay, Bay bus in the evenings instead of having it stop at 6:30. So the question is, will they extend some of the transit? times i.e. in Half Moon Bay and will they extend a transit system out into uh, Sandy Hook or up into the Tillicum Bay area thank you yeah that's a good good comment um, that is something we're going to be looking at um, I don't have an answer now you know there's there's obviously all sorts of solutions whether it's longer sir, longer um, route service or or potentially switching to more of like an on-demand bus where you know if it technically runs till nine, but it only runs if people need it so that you can sort of call ahead and say, I would like to get picked up. And there's sort of a lot of different options for um, accommodating transit. So that is that is something we're looking at from a high level. Um, we'll, we'll provide some recommendations and, and kind of look at it from a, how do we balance all of the different trips by all the different modes perspective. So we, we aim to have some sort of comments on that, but I don't know what they're going to be yet. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And Ian? 
Uh, I'll go to Kern now. Now, Kern, you're going to talk about some of the issues that Candice had raised earlier um, about shortcutting, acceleration rates, narrow roads, and RCMP coordination. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, Candice, so I, I met you on site uh, to talk about some of your issues. Uh, was that back in uh, February, I think? Um, so uh, I haven't forgotten about you. We do have a plan. We've drafted one. So uh, we're looking at on Cowrie a uh, one of those uh, speed tables, similar to what we have uh, further up the road. So installing another one of that, those um, additional signage um, so that people can't park where there's that kind of um, sight line issue that you uh, said there was a possible, almost an accident there, I believe was your, uh, what you said. And uh, the other thing we did recently was we had the uh, speed feedback signs. So um, those are deployed right near the high school. So if you go too fast, you get a grumpy red face. And if you're like under the speed limit, you get a happy green face. So um, we are doing those things. We just uh, were waiting um, for school to uh, be, be finished for the season uh, before we implement some of those things. But um, we do have a plan and um, I just, uh, we need to run it by stakeholders to make sure we're not causing any new issues, but uh, it's a pretty simple fix to, um, to do these. And uh, we could do, we do the speed tables as a first step, see what impact that's having. And then if we need to, we can uh, scale up to other measures, but uh, um, we'll try uh, one step at a time. And at some point uh, it should address the issue, but I think those are, those are kind of, I, I would say, micro scale traffic safety issues. And uh, I think where the transportation master plan comes into this is um, looking at the long term, because right now the situation on Cowrie is created because um, it's a relatively new linkage and there's no alternative. But as development occurs, uh, Barnacle will also have that connectivity. So it's looking at uh, what are going to be the alternatives down the road to cut down the amount of traffic on one street, we can, um, you know, as we develop other roads or development builds other roads um, in the future, the, the traffic issues on one street will be split onto two streets and, and hopefully that will help things. So I think um, in terms of the long-term vision, um, that's where the transportation master plan adds value, but on these, um, I think these smaller operational and traffic safety issues, it's, uh, um, always good to say, engage with us and uh, there might be a simple fix to some of these solutions. Hope that helps. Yeah, thank you, Kern. I hope you have Candice on your stakeholder list. <laughs> well, I think I have her email, so I'll, uh, I, can e I can email her a PDF of the plan. Perfect, thank you. Um, now, uh, Ian and Megan here, uh, there's a comment about emergency access. So it's really a concern. Um, there's no alternative access for emergencies uh, for the areas from Sandy Hook, um, Tillicum Bay and Tawanek. Is there anything that can be addressed in this plan? Um, so certainly, um, connections, um, not only here, but, but other locations within the district. Um, the fact that there is only a single route uh, through some sections um, is something we're very aware of. Um, and there may be opportunities to create alternate uh, routes in some of those locations, but of course there's jurisdictional constraints and, and uh, uh, land constraints as well. So um, that is something we're aware of. Uh, the plan may address some of those where possible. Um, it's some of the high level um, connection areas, um, but it is certainly something we're aware of. Thanks, Megan. Okay, and now this one, um, this one might actually be for Marina. Um, how will the plan consider the thoughts and voices of local youth? We are currently doing some engagement with youth um, in partnership with the school district. So we've been going into a couple of classes to test out, speaking to the kids directly about how they travel to and from school, but also to other destinations in their neighborhoods and trying to kind of get their perspective on it without imposing 
an adult's perspective. Um, and we will try to have a um, youth focus group so we can ask direct questions. Um, that will come a little ways into our public engagement. Um, and yeah, just trying to get the word out and have them involved just like anyone else. Um, and we're hoping that the plan can have a specific section or chapter or some recommendations around that topic. Thank you, Marina. I knew you were the right gal to answer that question. Okay, uh, we have another comment in here. Um, uh, so this individual would like to see the development in Seashell focus on pedestrians, cyclists, and transit before cars. Um, so instead of a car first approach uh, and then having to fight and advocate later for active transportation. Um, there's another comment as well um, that says that the transit times are too widely spaced to rely on. Um, in the same way that folks did when they lived in other uh, towns and cities. So now I understand that the, the buses um, uh, might be the jurisdiction of BC Transit, but I think this project team is uh, willing to advocate for some of those issues as well. Is that right, Megan? Yes, that's correct. So BC Transit is responsible for the transit network. However, we do get opportunities um, to uh, be a stakeholder in their planning process. Uh, and we can certainly advocate uh, and collect feedback from our community on how to shape their transit plan. Um, so we certainly will be collecting that feedback where we can't make BC Transit change their plan. We can certainly advocate for the community of Seashell. Hmm. And, okay. and coming back to the, the comment about um, not doing vehicle first, uh, that, that is very much in line with sort of the direction of the project um, because we're we're sort of falling under that community sustainability plan um, that's that's sort of what's driving this and and this is sort of the balance of you know i i, I don't know fully what the community wants um I mean, we're we're in the middle of or we're just starting trying to get that that feedback but but it's sort of at the end of the day that's going to be the focus of this is sort of how do we get how do we get people moving not in cars? Um, not not to say that we're going to make it impossible to drive in cars. And and I guess for those of you <laughs> who, based on the comments, there's not too many here right now. But um, for those who in cars, you know, the more the more people that take not cars, the the less cars are on the road. So, you know, I think if we can get people who want to to bike on the bike, then then that sort of will help make a lot of uh, a lot of people's trip a little better. Thanks, Ian. Now, um, Ian, you talked about that project vision earlier. Yeah. Um, you talked about thoughtful connections um, to make uh, the transpor transportation network inclusive, sustainable, and inviting. Now, I think you've gotten some feedback tonight about <laughs> inclusivity and sustainability, but we haven't heard very much about that inviting point. So would you would you like to talk a little bit about what you mean when you say inviting? Well, I think um, going back to uh, Susanna's comment about the the bike trail being amazing, right? Of of you know they can take that trip, they can get on their bike, they can go from A to B, they can get their shopping done. Um, and that's uh, like, that sort of seems to be inviting. It's it's not that. And then, you know, the the flip side is Bill's comment about crossing the road of, of if, if you can't, uh, if you don't feel safe crossing the road, that is not inviting. And regardless of what's on the other corner, if, you know, it might be a, you know, of three million dollars, but if you feel like you're going to die crossing it, you're not going to take it. So I think I think that's kind of what it is: is it's finding out what makes people comfortable, what brings them joy, what makes it enjoyable for them, and and kind of getting from A to B, and and trying to, you know, <laughs> make people look forward to their commute. Maybe it doesn't quite come, it doesn't quite have as much catchiness, maybe. But that's that would be the ideal thing if people are like, oh, good, I get to go to the store. That's exciting which is probably a little lofty. Okay, so it's, uh, so it's about enjoying the commute. Um, there's a oh. few uh, comments that say that trees and nice plantings make things inviting. 
Um, and I, does inviting also mean to people outside of the community? That it's an inviting, um, that it's easy to access, easy to get around, or, or is that not what, what it, that it means in, in the vision? Well, I, I, part, part, of the, part of a good vision statement is making it multi-leveled. So um, I think, you know, if, if Seashell became known as the, the place with the amazing sidewalks, like that, I'm sure that would be good for tourism or, or so on. Definitely for people outside and, and even I think, was it Bill's comment as well about the lighting, right? If there's no lighting, that's not very inviting. If, you're, if it gets dark at four in the evening and winter, you don't really want to be walking on the shoulder of a road in the dark. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, but honestly, I'd love to love to hear from the public whether it's in this meeting or or through other means of, like, what what is not inviting about the network and how can we fix that? That's that's sort of what we'd love to hear, and then we can have a, a better better understanding to build off of. Okay, um, so there is a comment here. Um, saying that people in Sandy Hook, Tillicum Bay, and Tawanek have no BC transit options, and so they must drive. Uh, and I do have a couple of questions. Uh, they look kind of technical here. Now, will the plan consider the life cycle costs of infrastructure in relation to the density of development? Holy moly, I need to think about that question to understand what that means. Um, Ian, you want to take a first crack at that? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the, I think uh, one, one, of the, one of the tasks is sort of an implementation plan. So it's, it's really fun to have a 20 year plan and get really excited about all these great things that are coming. And it's easy to look at that list and say, yeah, let's do all of this in the next five years. But that's, that's not really feasible. Um, so it's a balance of sort of understanding, you know, what funding is available for new development, what funding is available for maintenance, um, as well as how can we be more efficient? Can we, you know, there's been projects in the past where, um, you know, we were putting in bike lanes and instead of spending money to put new paint down, we just, uh, you know, the client was able to coordinate with maintenance and maintenance was going out every spring and painting lines. And we just said, hey, if you painted them, you know, a meter this way and put a bike stencil here, it would it would go a long way and, and sort of piggybacking and, and finding some of those efficiencies as an option and and even um, you know being efficient with the with the existing infrastructure. If if there's roadways that are wider than they need to be and there's extra asphalt, maybe we can repurpose that for bikes or for parking or or something else. So th there's a lot a lot to stake of you know what what funding is available, how can we you know, how much does maintenance cost? How quickly can we do things as well as where can we find some efficiencies to, to make that sustainable and, and, you know, slightly better. And I don't yeah. know if Megan wants to comment as well on that or not. Sure, yeah, I mean, that's certainly, that's certainly the goal uh, is to ensure that we're not underbuilding or overbuilding as we develop out um, and looking at the opportunities for, you know, should it be built out entirely or should we leave ourselves the ability to add additional infrastructure in the future as the density requires it. Um, and that's something that, that we're certainly very aware of. Um, and we want to ensure that we have the right level um, of build out as these communities become more dense, or these, sorry, these neighborhoods become more dense, uh, but we don't want to overbuild it um, because of that asset management uh, piece where we want to ensure that the life cycle um, costs make sense for the amount of, uh, of people that it's servicing. So, yeah, absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah, Thank you. And mm -hmm. also that, that sort of falls into that sort of right timing of how do we, how do we ensure that new developments have multiple choices, but also if we, if you don't do that, then you might end up with connectivity issues of you have this, you have this beautiful trail and then it stops for half a kilometer and then you have a beautiful trail again, just because of the development cycle and, and how do we to manage that? So that's, that's definitely things we're going to be looking at and working with the district to, to come up with a plan and, and try and try and smooth that out and make it as good as we can. So the second part of the question was, um, will it contemplate the appropriate level of infrastructure for low density neighborhoods? Yeah, I think, Joe, do you want to comment on that? I think some of the, the um, 
experience with sort of walkways or or um, pedestrian infrastructure that's not. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I'll I'll try. Um, I mean, if it's if it's a low volume, uh, if we're dealing with a, a low volume, uh, low speed road, then generally we don't need you know special infrastructure for bikes. They can share the space if if we're thirty kilometers an hour and and low volume. And um, the tricky thing with sidewalks is that from access accessibility standpoint, in my view, um, we should always try to have them on both sides or where there's residential frontage. Um, you know, there might be some uh, one-offs where there's a short cul-de-sac where one sidewalk is sufficient. Um, so I, I'd say it's, um, it's in line that way. Um, I think one of the issues though is probably transit service um, when it comes to servicing low res residential density areas. I mean, uh, most municipalities have a policy in place to try to, you know, service within a, a quarter mile or half a mile. Uh, of a home so that people have that choice. Um, that gets a little tricky, I think, um, just expense wise for municipality to service when um, you're sprawled out a little bit further and lower density. So just that comment on transit. Thank you, Joe and Ian. Um, and, you know, we're, we're five minutes out folks. Um, I am not seeing any more questions in the chat box and I'm not seeing any more hands up. So um, I think that we can wrap our meeting up knowing that everyone is invited to continue engagement um, through your say Seashelt or by emailing the communications team. And um, I'd like to pass it back over to Megan to see Megan if you would like to um, provide any closing remarks um, for the group here tonight. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, first of all, I uh, just want to say thank you to everyone for, for their time tonight. Um, it's, it's hard to carve out time for for volunteering for things like this and I really appreciate everyone coming out. Um, some really good questions, uh, excellent feedback for uh, you know, this early in the plan. Um, and I just hope that everyone can, can continue to, pers to participate uh, as we move forward with this plan. And, and uh, yeah, I appreciate the feedback. Wonderful, thank you. So with that, um, have a great evening, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you on June 2nd in person for the next engagement session. And then of course, in the fall again. So thank you very much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank Good you. night.